It is good to be back together for another week of worship, and I do trust that you came ready to hear a word from the Lord. You did, didn't you? Okay, that's why you came today. Just got to make sure. Last week, we began a new series in the Old Testament book of Numbers with the title, In the Wilderness. And so if you weren't here or if you need a refresher, I can catch you up a little bit. You can always go back and listen to those messages. They're available on our podcast, our YouTube. But let me just keep you in the loop. Uh, This is a book that specializes in Israel's 40 years of wandering in the wilderness after they escaped from Egypt, but before they got to the promised land. Last week, we saw that they were ready to begin their journey, one million Israelites in the wilderness at the base of Mount Sinai, getting into formation, taking their first steps toward their destination. That triumphant moment in Numbers 10 ends abruptly in chapter 11, and why did it abruptly end? The complaining, you remember. As the people began to complain just three days into the journey, they complain about the food, they reminisce about how good things were as slaves in Egypt, and they don't really like God's provision of manna. So God's anger burns against the people, and some died. And Moses is really struggling with this responsibility to lead this people. I would, you would. And so God sends a bunch of quail. We didn't cover this last week, but it was in the chapter. God sends a bunch of quail to their camp to feed some of them, but also a plague broke out amongst others and more people die. So it's what you could call a rocky start, right? So we'll look at Numbers 12 today, and a new challenge comes to Moses from within his own family. A sibling rivalry is something that it's worked its way into our vernacular because it's, well, common. I'm an only child, so I really have to reach for stories in this arena because I don't have any sibling rivalries of my own. I don't even have cousin rivalries. I know, it's kind of sad, isn't it? So I look to stories to get inspiration to think about today. So I want to tell tell you about a good old-fashioned American sibling rivalry that maybe you've never heard of before. Dr. John Harvey Kellogg came out of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and as you may know, they're quite health-conscious. John built a famous uh, career as a physician and operated a wellness spa in Battle Creek, Michigan. Many celebrities frequented the exclusive establishment. He would often experiment with new foods and creations, and he tried to work on things that aided people in their digestion. Through trial and error and a little bit of luck, An accident, John Kellogg and the staff, which included his younger brother, Will Kellogg, created a large, thin sheet of a crunchy corn product that would break up into little flakes to eat. This was a health product at first, primarily for digestive health of the guests of the resort. Younger brother Will was often mistreated by his older brother, sadly. He was underpaid, underappreciated, and often demeaned in the workplace by his older brother, John. And so he saw an opportunity to adjust this product for mass consumption, adding a little sugar, a little salt flavoring, which John never would have done, to make it into a breakfast cereal for the masses. Will took the recipe and acquired the rights and went out to create a company in 1906 called the Battle Creek Toasted Corn Flake Company. He improved the recipe, put that classic rooster advertising on that we now know as the product what? Cornflakes. Anybody be brave enough to say, I ate cornflakes today? Anybody? Is there one? Is there one? Wow, they really need to work on that. Maybe one? Okay. The success of cornflakes began a bitter rivalry between the brothers, John and Will Kellogg. John tried to sue in court for the use of the family name to no avail. Uh, They spent many years competing with each other and suing each other. Will became obsessed with beating out his older brother. The families on both sides lost contact. Marriages fell apart. It became bitter to the end. John Kellogg indicated at the end of his life regret for the relationship that, uh, with his brother that he never had, that they never reconciled. It's a sad story. So every time you eat cornflakes, I want you to feel sad. <laughs> I want you to feel the sadness of sibling rivalry when you eat your cornflakes. 
Now, what I want to look at in our text today in Numbers 12 is when Moses was bitterly opposed by his own siblings, Miriam and Aaron. However, there's a lot going on beyond that. We will see in the text that this criticism of Moses really isn't a criticism about Moses. It's about God. So we're going to look at the form of rebellion today that seems soft on the surface, but really it's still rebellion against God. And so I hope that we're challenged today to live a life that never seeks to undermine God's good plan for us. So before we look at God's word, please pray with me. Lord, as we open your word, we recognize you always speak to us when it's opened, and so we ask you to do it again. Would you help us today? Teach us, correct us, rebuke us, Lord. Encourage us. Help us to see the truth that you have laid out for us as we simply look to what you have said. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and turn to Numbers 12.1. That's where we'll be. I think today can serve as a case study. That's why I titled it. A case study of soft rebellion. Now, I want you to know there's big air quotes around soft rebellion because there is no, it's all rebellion if it's rebellion, right? But I want you to understand what I'm saying. It's easy to spot rebellion that looks like a riot or pitchforks and torches, which is coming in numbers, by the way. That's coming. It's easy to spot when someone curses God and shakes their fist to the sky and declares themselves a hater of God. However, most of the time, rebellion against God doesn't look like that. It's a lot softer. It's more acceptable in our circles. And that's what we're accustomed to today. So Miriam and Aaron, they're church people, so to speak. They're church people. They know how to work the system. They know what they should and shouldn't say aloud and who to say it in front of. Uh, Aaron was Moses' brother. Okay, I never want to assume you already know these people. Aaron was Moses' brother and was the high priest of Israel, the first one. He was not a man ignorant of God or of the law. Miriam is Moses' sister. She was responsible for saving him as a baby. If you go all the way back to the birth story of Moses, placing him into the river. She was also a leader of the women in song in Exodus 15. Actually, she's described as a prophetess in the Bible. Neither of these are slouches. Okay, neither of these are unspiritual people. However, they're about to have a problem. As we read and study today, I want you to hear this in the context of Numbers 12, but also as a general case study for soft rebellion against God. To rebel against God does not require declarations of hate for him, or shouting at the heavens, or joining a Satanist cult. It doesn't take that to be a rebel. I want you to see that there is a more common, softer rebellion that's likely being used by your friends, your family, maybe something you're going through right now. Maybe this message will help you diagnose and address and engage with that. So in our case study of soft, acceptable rebellion against God, we see number one, there's often a smokescreen complaint. That's number one. If you're taking notes, and I hope you are, the smokescreen complaint. So we're going to read Numbers 12, 1, just to get the ball rolling. God's word says, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. Okay. So this just kind of comes out of the blue. If you're like, that seems kind of random, it is real random in the text. Moses' brother and sister appear, and they are just speaking ill of Moses and his wife. The text doesn't say whether this was like private gossip, public gossip, uh, to Moses directly with his wife there, whether they're just complaining privately. We don't know, but we know they're having open, negative conversation. We also know from the Hebrew construction of this sentence, it seems like Miriam is the ringleader. Uh, and Aaron is a more passive presence accompanying the complaint. So she's actually out there complaining, and Aaron is sort of, you know, five feet back saying, yeah, yeah, you get him, you tell him. Now, what's the complaint? The complaint is the Cushite woman Moses married. The sister doesn't like the wife. I would imagine that's not fun at Thanksgiving. Now, why would this be an issue? Now, scholars are divided on this. I won't get into the weeds right now. I'll just give you a taste. Some believe that this woman is Zipporah, 
okay? The woman already named in Exodus as the wife of Moses. But then if that was the case, the follow-up question would be, is it normal to call a person from Midian, which we know she was from, a Cushite? Because Cush was more synonymous with Ethiopia in those days. Or Africa, south of Egypt, a lot of that they just called Cush, okay? So another thing is, why would this just now be a problem if this was the long-standing wife of Moses? That's another concern. The other view is that this is not Zipporah, this is another woman, and that Zipporah had either died or gone back to Midian. Then the issue becomes, well, why do they dislike her? The land of Cush was not a people that they were banned from marrying. They could not marry the Canaanites, but Cush was not on, that, on the banned list. Um, some believe that the term Cushite had become synonymous with darker skinned people and that this was actually a racial ethnic problem that they were unhappy that Moses took a wife that was not an Israelite or as the leader of Israelites, that he didn't marry another Israelite. So the intention from Miriam is really difficult to, to pinpoint in this text other than she does not like Moses' wife, who was a Cushite woman. Now, before your mind races all over the place trying to figure out this complaint, let me just stop you there. This is a smokescreen. This is a smokescreen. This is not the real issue. It has little to do with where this passage is headed and the actual beef with Moses. It makes up probably 5% of the actual problem they have with Moses. Now you might be saying, Pastor, what are you talking about? It's the lead off complaint. It's what they started with. They wouldn't say it if it wasn't a real issue. And what I'm telling you is that it is a real complaint. They really didn't like Moses' wife. However, it is not their issue. It's a front. It's an external issue, a smoke screen for the issue to come. And before we read ahead to the real issue, that's coming in the text, I just want to affirm that most people who voice their problems with God or with the church are vo voicing smoke screen issues. People might say, you know, I don't think the Bible is a trustworthy document. It has contradictions. They might say, I think we ought to have female pastors. I don't understand why we can't. They might say, I don't like politics in church. They might say, I don't like the church's stance on homosexuality. They might say, I don't like the music around here. Again, those are all real. Just like how Miriam really didn't like Moses' wife. But what often happens is if you press and you push and you dig down, the root is something else. We've seen the smoke screen issue. Now we're going to look at number two, the sincere issue. The sincere issue, number two. Here's where we get down to brass tacks. Read Numbers 12, 1 through 2. We'll get the running head start. It says, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he married, for he had married a Cushite woman. Verse 2. And they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. That's always scary when that's how it ends, by the way. Verse 2 introduces a new criticism of Moses echoed by Miriam and Aaron. They're voicing their opinion that Moses seems to be doing a job that they felt they also could be doing. They said, has the Lord indeed spoken, you might want to circle, only through Moses? Well, what about us? The Lord speaks to us too? And guess what? There's an element of truth to that. The Lord did speak to Aaron as the high priest. We hope he does. The Lord did speak to Miriam as a leader among women and a, a songwriter. She really did. Their position is that Moses is getting a lot of what seems to be preferential treatment, face time, stage time, senior leadership, unique position among the people, and they feel they should be getting some of that too. Now, a great irony in this text, if you've been reading chronologically like we have, is that just one chapter previous, we see the great weight and burden of leadership upon Moses weeping and begging God to take away this burden from him to lead this people. Oftentimes, people want the status of leadership, but they have no idea the personal cost it will take. Moses probably would have given this job away if it were up to him, but it were not up to him. So Miriam 
and Aaron revealed their sincere issue right there, the second question. Yeah, you can tell that's like the real problem, right? When they said it out loud, you're like, oh, that's the problem. We think we can run this show better than you, God. We don't like the way God's running this world. We have a better idea. If God would just listen to us, we could improve on his system. Hear us, God, three spokespeople rather than one. See, we've got a better idea. God messed up when he put Moses in charge of this whole operation. It ought to be Moses and Miriam and Aaron's name in lights. They didn't say all that, but you know, they kind of said that. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the issue. And all that stuff about the Cushite wife, that's nothing. That's 5%. That's the, this is the one that has the roots. And again, that's often what happens in our lives as well. The smoke screen issue is real, but it's only about 5% of the issue. The real issue often is this in life, as people have their disputes, I don't want to do it God's way. That's the deep issue. I don't want to be accountable to God. I don't want to do what he says. Now, look at verse 3. You got some more information here. Verse 3 says, and this is just a little aside. Now the man Moses was very meek, more than all people who were on the face of the earth. Now, why would that verse be in there? It's to show Moses wasn't in this position because he was a glory hog. He wasn't desperate for fame and fortune. In fact, if you remember, if we want to pull up past stories, Exodus 4.10 Moses tells the Lord, I don't want to be the leader because I'm not good at public speaking, Lord. Please put Aaron in. Remember that story? Aaron's only in because Moses brought him in. Moses was not in this for any reason other than God called him to the task and summoned him the whole way. Moses took the brunt of criticism from Miriam and Aaron, and so did his wife. But Moses didn't do anything to deserve it. But then again, ultimately, this is not an attack on Moses. It's an attack on God. How? Sure, on the outside, they're saying, hasn't God spoken to us too? Why does Moses get all the glory? Sure, they're saying that on the outside. But who set up the system with Moses as the intercessor and main prophet of Israel? God set it up, right? So what are they saying? What are they really saying? God Your system stinks. That's what they're saying. We don't like the way you're running things. That's the sincere issue at the root. And listen, that's often the way it is with our neighbors and friends and family who don't believe. We spend time arguing about smokescreen issues. But deep down, if a man or woman hates God or the way he runs the world, you got to deal with the root issue. We argue about critical race theory and gender ideology and gay marriage, and guess what? Biblically, we ought to. But remember, if you're debating someone who thinks God is running this world all wrong and they could do better, that's your issue. That's the real problem. Maybe you've heard the atheist motto. This is kind of jokey, but the atheist motto is, there's no God and I hate him. You ever heard that before? There is no God and I hate him. Why is that both true and comical at the same time? Because there's something that resonates with the deep spiritual reality that much of the arguing and fighting in our culture are about the various symptoms and our smoke screens for the fact that our culture hates God. And Miriam and Aaron should have known better. Moses' wife was not the issue. The issue was they didn't like what God was doing. So we've seen the smokescreen issue. We've seen the sincere issue. And now number three in our case study, we see the settled standard. Number three, the settled standard. You've said your piece. You've said your piece. Now what? We've got to get some truth up in here, right? Someone's got to have the correct answer. So we'll see God enter the story now. I debated titling this sermon, Come See Me in My Office, but I didn't. You'll see why. Numbers 12, 4 through 9. Let's read this together. And suddenly the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron and to Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tent of meeting. Gulp. And the three of them came out. 
And the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forward. And he said, hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth, clearly, and not in riddles, and he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. If you thought the principal's office was bad, imagine God Almighty saying, come out you three to the tent of meeting. And when you get there, the pillar of cloud is towering over you with a voice thundering from the cloud. Now, what does God do in this moment? He corrects Miriam and Aaron. Moses is not actually in trouble, but he's there. So this is vindication for Moses. And note, there's no discussion about the Cushite wife, right? That, that's not even in the conversation. If the wife was a problem with God, God had a great opportunity right there to say, and by the way, Moses, this is a problem with you. Didn't happen. So on that front, Miriam and Aaron had a problem that God didn't have. And also, Moses is the one who takes issue, uh, isn't the one who takes the issue with the complaint. Isn't that interesting? Moses isn't the one that said, hey, let's go talk to God about this. God calls them in. God defends Moses' honor. Most importantly, what we see God do here is set the standard. God sets the standard. He restates the plan. He gives his will to Miriam and Aaron, and it sounds like this. All right, this is the Jared Crest paraphrase, okay? I talk to Moses differently. I treat Moses differently. Yes, I have prophets like you, and I speak to them in visions and dreams, but with Moses, I talk straight up with no prophetic poetry or imagery, just plain talking. Moses gets to see more of me than anybody else. He's special. That's the system. I want one man to speak to me as the intercessor of this nation. That's my plan. It's what I want. And that's what God says. And then God finishes by saying this. And by the way, why were you not afraid to speak against my servant, Moses? You should have been afraid. Huh. You see, God set this plan up. Not Moses. Moses. This was God's standard. This was the way he wanted things to operate. And for Miriam and Aaron to feel comfortable mouthing off about God's standards was angering to God. His anger was kindled. Now, here's the most important thing you'll hear all week long. I'm going to save you some time and heartache. Ready? You ready for it? When God has spoken and, we has, and when he has set a standard in place, the way you feel about it does not change the standard. I love you, but I need to tell you something as a messenger from God today, okay? You and I don't make up a single rule in this universe. We can cry foul all day long, but God is the sovereign monarch, and we're not. Now, look at what happens in this story. You can draw a thousand parallels to your life. Miriam and Aaron say, God, we don't like your system. With Moses being the go-between, you need to add us to the rotation. We hear from you too. And how does God respond? He rehearses back the standard to them. He says, look, here's what I do. I talk to prophets, visions and dreams, but I talk to Moses how I want to talk to Moses because he's my guy. And quite frankly, you're too comfortable criticizing my plans. Listen, everyone, you need to know this is not what our culture is peddling right now, especially to our younger generation. The message of our time is that you can have your truth and I can have my truth and we can agree to disagree about who God is and what he wants from us and what his plans are for us. But I'm telling you, that's not how it works. You can't just make an alternative standard that's different from what God has laid out in scripture. You can't do it. We are far too comfortable and casual with almighty God. Just because your faith and approach to God is casual, doesn't make God a casual God. He's not. We don't get to tell God what is right and wrong. We learn from him what is right and wrong. 
And I don't want you to think that you can never ask a question of, of your church or of the Bible or of God. It's okay to ask honest questions. But there's a difference in asking God a question versus questioning God. Those are two very different things. There's a big difference in asking, Lord, what do you want me to do in this big decision? That's asking a question. Versus, why do I have to ask God about my big decisions? Those are two very different questions. This text today is not really how you often hear it preached. You know how you often hear this text preached? It's a leadership message. How easy would it be for me, and advantageous, quite honestly, to put myself in the role of Moses and tell you not to criticize me or else God's going to mess you up? It'd be real easy for me to do that, right? But I'm not Moses, and that's not the point of the text. The point is this. Here's the point of the text. When God has clearly given us a standard, when he has revealed his will to us, and we know what he wants from us, we ought to tremble at the thought of criticizing him and working around his standard. That's the point. We should never be comfortable telling God, I know better than you. Well, the story's not over. There's a strange resolution to this encounter, and Miriam takes the brunt of it. So let's read this conclusion together in Numbers 12, 10, and we'll finish out this chapter. Verse 10 says, when the cloud removed from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous like snow. And Aaron turned toward Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said to Moses, O oh, my Lord, do not punish us because we have done foolishly and have sinned. Let her not be as one dead whose flesh is half eaten away when he comes out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried to the Lord, O oh God, please heal her, please. But the Lord said to Moses, If her father had but spit in her face... Should she not be shamed seven days? Let her be shut outside the camp seven days, and after that she may be brought in again. So Miriam was shut outside the camp seven days, and the people did not set out on the march till Miriam was brought in again. After that, the people set out from Hazeroth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. Easy text, right? <laughs> after God laid down the law... He removes Israel from the tent. He removes himself from the tent, excuse me, and Miriam was leprous. Now, leprosy in the Bible, you got to know, it was a, a catch-all term for them that included a wide variety of skin ailments, oftentimes contagious. And so, uh, if you want a whole chapter, if you just want some reading on uh, contagious skin diseases, you'll love Leviticus 13. It's there just for you. But... You should know that a system was developed to separate the infected, effectively quarantine, boy, I'm tired of hearing that word, quarantine them outside the camp when they showed symptoms. And you can imagine that infectious diseases in these days were very, very difficult to deal with once they got started. Whether or not this was a death sentence, we don't really know because we don't know exactly what the disease was because leprosy can mean a lot of things in the Bible. But if someone's skin had turned completely white, that's not good. And also, Aaron mentions rotting flesh, so perhaps this was imminent death. If not, let's say it was just a, life, a lifetime of leprosy, it would mean Miriam's expulsion from the camp. She couldn't come back inside. She would have to go from being in the in crowd, in the innermost in crowd, to living off of charity on the outskirts of town. And maybe perhaps that's what message God was trying to teach. Oh, you want inside? You want to be on the end? I'll put you out as far as you can go. Now, what I think is really powerful is that in, uh, it's Moses in verse 13 who cries out to the Lord. Did you notice that when we were reading? Moses is the one that cries out to the Lord to heal Miriam after everything she had said. Now, imagine someone criticizes your spouse and tries to take your job. That's what Miriam did. And yet we see Moses intercede for her. He goes to God on her behalf and begs for her healing. Talk about pray for those who persecute you, right? So in this wild moment, Miriam's a leper. Aaron repents verbally, we assume truly, and asks for mercy. And Moses begs for healing from God. Now, what does God do? 
he says to Moses a line that I'm just going to tell you is a little, a little strange, okay? Strikes us as strange. He says, if her father had but spit in her face, should she not be shamed seven days? Let her be shut outside the camp seven days, and after that she may be brought in again. Just so you know, you got preachers that will never read that verse aloud, okay? Here we are. There are statements in the law about spitting and defilement, okay? There's a great chapter if you want some more Leviticus reading on, on body fluids, and I'll just leave it there if you want to read it. But not this exact scenario. This is a very specific scenario. I didn't see it there. So what it seems to indicate is a case that uh, historically and culturally this, this is more relevant. A daughter would do something shameful to her house to dishonor her father. And he, in response, would spit in her face. You can say right, wrong. I'm, not, I'm just telling you that's what happened. That's a cultural thing. And it doesn't resonate with us. But even if you go to the New Testament... As Jesus was going through the cross on his trial, they spit in his face, did they not? Because that tradition stayed for a long time. And in that hypothetical case, God says, because you'd be unclean if somebody spit in your face, it was a defilement. God says, wouldn't the daughter have to at least be put outside the camp seven days to be brought back in? And the answer was yes. According to the law, she would. Now, as strange as that is, and I grant it strange, Here's one of the silver linings in the book of Numbers. Miriam, if she wasn't going to die from leprosy, was at least destined to a lifetime outside the camp. A life of shame. Cut off from the tabernacle, can't come in and worship with God's people. And guess what? That's what she deserved for her sin against God. But God did show mercy in that she only had to go seven days outside the camp. Now, God showed mercy, but he also still showed justice, didn't he? Miriam still had to deal with her sin. She had to sit in her mess, but only for seven days compared to an entire lifetime. Sure, there was public humiliation, shame, and isolation for a week, but ultimately God would heal her and bring her back by his grace and mercy, not because he had to, listen, but because Moses prayed because Moses prayed for mercy. You need to know that our God is a God of justice and of standards. There are real consequences to our sin. Real humiliation and shame and physical ailments and isolation. And those are just a few. But do you know that God is also a God of mercy and grace? You know, you don't have to spend a lifetime outside the camp away from God's presence. Can I tell you something really, really cool that God showed me in this text? In the Old Testament passage we just read, Moses swoops in and intercedes for Miriam, who had been cursing him. And Moses puts himself in between her and God and begs for her healing and salvation so that she would not be put to shame in a life outside the camp. In the New Testament, it's the same holy God Sin has the same consequences, death, shame, being cut off, but we get something much, much better than Moses. We get Jesus. And as great as Moses was, Jesus is better. And he intercedes between us and God when we have sinned, except he doesn't beg God to heal us like Moses did. No, Jesus took the leprosy, took the sin, took the shame, and took the death upon his own body. And by faith, we can experience freedom from the consequences of sin. Yes, sin has its consequences here right now in this life. We live in a fallen world, and some mistakes you make will have real-world consequences that stay with you for life. But it is a mere seven days outside the camp compared to the eternity that we get to spend in the presence of God if we are saved. We have seen the smokescreen complaints about Moses' wife. That wasn't the deep issue, but it showed a brewing problem. We have seen the sincere issue, desiring that God would operate in a different way, allowing Miriam and Aaron to do what Moses did. We have seen the settled standard as God pulled them aside and said exactly what his plans are and how he intends to govern his people and that we shouldn't question that lightly or criticize him. And we have seen the supplication 
for mercy as Moses steps in to intercede for the very sister who scorned him. We see a reminder of Jesus who stepped in to save the very ones who scorned him, namely you and me. So church, don't live a life that undermines God's will for you. When he has spoken, be very careful to criticize his plans and his ways and his word. Be very careful to think that you could do things better were you in charge. You may not fancy yourself a rebel because you're not holding a pitchfork or shaking your fist to the sky, but soft rebellion is a real threat. Thinking you can tweak and change and adjust what God wants to do is still rebellion. So trust the Lord with all your heart. And when things grow difficult, lean not upon your own understanding. Do not acknowledge the need for yourself to be elevated, but rather in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Pray with me.